Well, I want to welcome everybody to another uh, NNCI webinar. My name is David Gottfried. I'm the Deputy Director of the NNCI Coordinating Office. Um, this month's webinar is focused on computation, and in a moment, I'll hand it over to my colleague, uh, Zad Naimi, to introduce today's speaker. Um, I want to mention that this is the last of the NNCI webinars for 2021. We're going to take a break in December. And hopefully we'll be back to presenting you um, a monthly webinars starting in January 2022. Uh, I also wanted to mention if you have missed any of our previous webinars, you can find all of the recordings on our YouTube channel. And you can find the YouTube channel by Googling NNCI and YouTube. And I think we were the, the number one uh, at the top of the list there when you do that. So um, you can find all of the previous uh, recordings in, in this NNCI webinar series. And with that, I will sign off and hand it over to Azad to introduce our speaker today. Thank you, David. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, special webinar. Uh, we are happy today to have uh, Dr. Sheila Abu uh, as our speaker. Um, Sheila is a senior product mar marketing manager at Synopsys. She has a PhD from Arizona State University and more than 20 years of experience in TCAT tool development, application support, and pro product marketing. And she's been with TCAT Group uh, for the past seven years. She um, has authored more than 100 peer-reviewed publications and presentations at uh, prestigious international conferences and workshops. And without further ado, Sheila, please go ahead. Thank you for the kind introduction. Let me go ahead and share my presentation. Welcome everyone to my talk titled The Evolution of Process TCAD in Semiconductor R&D and Manufacturing, and a special thank you to the NNCI team for this kind invitation. The outline of my talk is as follows. I'll start with the impact that semiconductor electronics has on society, and then I'll follow with the role that TCAD simulations play in developing these technologies. Then I'll cover how Process TCAD has evolved over time, including the discussion of two new tools that we're working on at Synopsys, and those are Centaurus Topography and Quantum ATK. And then I'll conclude with some discussion on our future direction in manufacturing digital twins. So first, in terms of the impact that semiconductor electronics have on society, we're actually in a really exciting time. We have several new market drivers that are coming out right now that are really driving some exciting technology. We have 5G, the Internet of Things, augmented virtual mixed realities, autonomous driving, vehicle electrification. And all of these market drivers are really going towards enabling specific systems. And those are our artificial intelligence systems, our cloud computing and data centers, and our power electronics. And the role that, that semiconductor electronics has is to really enable these systems through technology. So developments such as 3D integration and neuromorphic computing drive AI-specific hardware. Photonics drives the data center communication bandwidth. Data encryption and security can be realized through quantum computing. And system efficiency can be improved through new novel power devices. What this really translates in terms of the actual market for ICs is projected to be a continuous annual growth rate of nearly 10% over the next five years with, with nearly a half a trillion dollars expected in 2021. So as Moore's Law is coming to an end, the semiconductor market is clearly showing no signs of slowing down. And if anything, these new market drivers and system enablers are impacting 
even more. So now what role does TCAD simulations play in developing these technologies? Traditionally, we've used TCAD to optimize development cycles and save time in the processing. So we've used it primarily in three areas. One would be pathfinding kind of research level where we look at designing a specific device architecture and structure and then running those on the computer and, and assessing what the output characteristics are of these new devices. Another area is module development where we look at improving and designing individual process steps on how to fabricate. So for instance, uh, an etch would be a type of module development where we figure out using TCAD process tools how to optimize a specific process. And then also process integration where we take multiple modules and integrate them together. Using TCAD in the development cycle has been shown from ITRS to improve costs by nearly 40%. So nowadays, the complexity of these devices is, is increasing at each technology node. Here I show the, the nodes from 65 up to about 20, which really exhibit just planar CMOS technology. As we scale up, we're entering a domain where our devices are starting to become more and more 3D. And this increases the complexity and essentially raises the cost of the processing in the, in the process. And then as we scale even farther, we're, we're now facing even more levels of complexity with more combinations of new materials and new combinations of device architectures that can be chosen in order to continue our scaling. In addition to this, there are also several new areas identified through the road, through semiconductor roadmap. And so on top of new transistor architectures like FinFETs and gate all around nanosheets, we have new integrations such as CFETs, new material channels such as 2D materials, in addition, we have scaling boosters. These have to do with how we can reduce the footprint of the device without directly scaling the transistor and include things like new power delivery networks. In addition, derivative markets such as RF and memory are also driving new transistor architectures, as well as heterogene heterogeneous integration schemes where individual model modules are manufactured separately and then combined at the package level. So now given all these new options for designing transistors, how do we evaluate which option is the best? So the simple answer is DTCO, Design Technology Co-Optimization. This method has been around for several years and is as proven to be a useful technique to couple the design level experiments back to the technology options. Here I show a schematic of the DTCO flow. On the left is the technology side where we select the materials we're interested in using, the transistor architecture, the patterning for the process, integration schemes, lithography choices. And we can optimize on the left um, before we start looking at how these transistors actually work in a regular standard cell. So we feed our transistor characteristics and this data into our design enablement section. We generate early PDKs and we can then characterize our, our um, standard cell mini libraries. These are then placed, these are then um, passed on to synthesis, place and route, place and route. And we can evaluate our power, performance, area, and cost of these choices that we on the left. And if we don't get the target that we want, the target performance, 
then we loop back into either our technology side or our design enablement side. And in the process, we can co-optimize both our technology choices and our design choices simultaneously. So currently, both TCAD and DTCO are used in the development of advanced process technologies. I denote the space where we apply DTCO is really just the pathfinding section now, but it's, I include the arrow to show that it's, it's proceeding over to, to the right, and over time it'll be used more within the process integration and module development. We actually include, we actually encounter similar scaling challenges in the area of logic. As DRAM and NAM are both scaled down to the 10 nanometer range, they approach their physical limits and both face substantial challenges, not only to scaling the memory array, but also the peripheral circuit. Common to both are challenges in the capacitor scaling in terms of the high aspect ratio patterning, which you can see here on the right with the NAND. This causes stress, leakage problems, and variability and reliability issues. For the peripheral circuit, which is based on silicon transistors, the challenge is to reduce the variability as well as transition from the planar CMOS to FinFET architectures. While DRAM and NAND continue to scale beyond emerging memories such as FE RAM, STT RAM, and resistive RAM are also being developed and each require different types of materials, device architectures, and performance targets that need to be optimized. So now how has Process TCAD evolved over time to keep up with technology? So essentially, since the 1980s, Planar CMOS has essentially relied on a, on a core set of process modules techniques. And these I show here on the left. They essentially include ion implantation over a wide energy range, dopant diffusion and activation, epitaxial growth, etching, both reactive ion etching and wet etching, deposition in different flavors of chemical vapor deposition, CVD types, oxidation, both under dry and wet conditions, and chemical and mechanical planarization. With these process steps, we can combine them into a flow, which here I show on the right, to create your CMOS. So this CMOS is a, corresponds to a 180 nanometer node AMD device. And as we see each of the steps, oops, pardon me, each of the steps one through seven essentially forms the front end of line steps and goes, we can see, we go through, we have a, a twin well implant, which corresponds to our ion implant. And then we have shallow trench isolation gate structure, lightly doped drain implants. These drain implants correspond to our dopant diffusion and activation as well as the source drain implants here. And so each of these can be realized using one of these steps here. Now transitioning over to FinFETs, I'll just let this movie on the right play. It corresponds to these modules steps on the left. We see we have fin patterning, the deposition and recess, gate patterning, spacer deposition, then we go through our source drain epitaxy, then we go into our, our um, interlayer dielectric and planarization. We have a couple novel modules that are, are developed for FinFET specifically, which have to do with the high K metal gate that these FinFETs have. So this constitutes the front end of line. Our middle end of line then is composed of our contact formation and our M0 patterning, which is the first metal layer and our back end of line denotes the metal layers above that. Let that play for a moment. 
I won't have time to let it play all the way through. I'll go ahead and stop it here, but you can see how as we go through these steps, this FinFET structure is built up. So now as we transition past FinFETs, we look more towards devices based on nanowires and nanosheets. So this is one process flow for a nanosheet, which for these structure, these advanced nodes, we still have essentially the same processing techniques, but combined into different optimized modeling. And you can see in this flow, we're getting more and more situations in which we need high precision etching involved. So in this case, when we're growing these nano sheets, we grow on top of our substrate, we grow layers of silicon, silicon germanium as we go up, and then we need to etch these trenches. In addition to this etch step, there's another etch step where we need to remove these silicon germanium regions in order to include the um, high gay metal gate and around each of these silicon nano sheets or nano wires. So etching is becoming more and more important. In addition to etching, selective processes are also becoming more and more important. And selecting is important because of the small, these small spaces. And I'll come back to this issue later in my talk. So in addition to the nano sheets, other areas where we need um, very tight control of etching and deposition would be, for instance, in the source drain regions for epitaxial growth, silicon germaning selective etching, which I discussed in the last slide, contact etching and deposition, even fin etching for fin fets, and then high aspect ratio trenches like I showed for the NAND. So this really shows the rising need that we have for topological simulations. So I won't go over this slide completely. It's, it's kind of a, a, there's a lot of information on it. This slide is, is, comes from TEL. And I wanted to show it to kind of show all of the different areas that these, these self-aligned um, processes are, are playing a role, essentially. So in these com com complicated advanced nodes, we have complicated shapes and, and it's getting harder and harder to really realize these, these shapes at these really small sizes. And so industry really looks towards self-aligned techniques and in, in order to realize these small feature size sizes. In addition, when a um, uh, approach is self-aligned or self-limited, this, re this really reduces the number of mask steps which you need and will also drive down cost. So this is, makes ALD and ALE processes particularly attractive for the future nodes because they have the benefit of both being self-aligned because they're based on specific chemical reactions that occur on surfaces and they also can be self-limited. So they only grow a prescribed amount based on how much of the surface is exposed, or they only etch a certain amount based on what material needs to be etched. So I hope I gave you kind of a positioning of, of semiconductor electronics market and how TCAD and specifically process TCAD plays a role in developing these technologies. And now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk a bit about what Synopsys is doing and our approach to developing tools to keep up with the needs of process TCAD. So here's a slide that kind of shows our family of tools. Um, we have a very comprehensive set of tools. I'll be just talking about a subsection today. So in general, we have our process simulation tools here. We have a Centaurus process and Centaurus topography. We also have process emulation tools, which is process explorer and structure editor, 
we have several device simulation tools as well as a, um, interconnect simulation tools. And then we also have some TCAD to SPICE capabilities as well as atomic scale modeling tools, which I'll talk a bit more in detail. So first, our Centaurus process simulator. It is a 2D or 3D process simulator. And the most accurate results come through the advanced model calibration. We've had many collaborations through the years with equipment vendors and leading universities, and our Process Explorer is really a gold standard in terms of in terms of creating devices in terms of process TCAD. There's a 3D geometric modeling engine with level set algorithms, and it includes all of the basic physics models. So we have ion implantation, which can be done either analytically or through Monte Carlo. It accounts for diffusion, either through laser or flash, flash annealing, also through kinetic Monte Carlo algorithms. We can do epitaxial growth, mechanical stress, and complex 2D and 3D oxidation. Our other tool, Centaurus Topography, is a physical deposition and etch simulator. And what this tool does is it simulates the deposition and etch processing and can use, and it has two different methods which can be used, either level set or a particle Monte Carlo tool. The deposition models that are currently implemented include several versions of CVD, chemical vapor deposition, as well as SOG and reflow. The etch models include wet etch, REI, iron milling, and the chemical mechanical polishing. In addition to the built-in models, there's also a general PMI model, which is a physical model interface, which allows for, for, for general algorithms to be included. So really the, the majority of, currently the majority of silicon technology production really relies extensively on etching and deposition processes. And the ultimate goal for, for topology simulations is really to move away from, from doing simulations on a computer with point tools, but leading more towards creating a virtual lab where one can directly measure results from, a, a, or directly take information from the equipment and be able to run process TCAD. And so to explicitly link the equipment modeling to the TCAD simulations so that we can know given some certain process settings, what our device properties will be. So I'll talk more about this in the, in the last part of my talk. For now, I wanna come back to this idea of our quantum ATK tool and what, how we can use that tool to develop our topograph, topology simulations. So quantum ATK, it is an atomistic simulation tool. It's primarily, we use it for our density functional theory calculations, which are ab initio simulations. We have several different flavors of DFT. We have a plane wave DFT as well as a DFT based on local atomic orbitals. In addition to structural, structural simulations, we can also do transport. So we, there's an NEGF solver as well. Um, on top of the ab initio simulations, we can also run molecular dynamics and force bias Monte Carlo simulations. Currently, we're working on a new quantum ATK tool that is explicitly used for simulating ALD and ALE processes. We call this, this tool the Surface Process Simulation Module, which I'll denote as SPS for short. So this module is a GUI based, is based on a GUI, is a GUI based workflow. And it's the, we can use the GUI to set up, run and visualize simulations. Essentially, one takes a 
sur specific surface that they're interested in simulating, and they choose a specific um, gas phase species that they want to put into the environment. So this would be on the left here, this gas A. The gas is given a certain, certain energetics, and it's either when working, or excuse me, let me back up a little bit. So for the deposition case, we have a gas A that, in, that represents um, our, our impacting gas species. It hits the substrate. It creates a chemical reaction on this surface. This surface is then, um, a second gas is impinged on this surface. And if this second gas um, makes the first gas disappear, it's an ALE process. Otherwise, um, if it creates more of the original substrate, then it's an ALD surface. So that's kind of this what this cartoon means. Now, what the GUI does is it allows for the selection of a certain gas and chemical reaction that occurs, and we simulate the process, and the output will be, um, we can look at the sticking coefficients or the sputtering yields due to those different gases that impinge on the substrate. There's different calculators that we can use. As I said, we have more than just DFT. We can also use molecular dynamics simulations, which are useful because these can be very time consuming. And so we're working to, to really optimize this tool. In addition, there's a direct link to Centaurus topography. So once we get these ab initio simulation data, we can then feed into that tool. So let me go a little more in detail and give you kind of an example of what the needs are for this, the development of this SPS module. So on the left, as I said, you start with some substrate. Here is a, I think this is a hafnium oxide substrate. And then we want to look at a growth process. So the first question we need to ask is, well, what reactants do we want to choose? So these, these chemicals will come down onto the surface, a chemical reaction will form, and then the chemicals will either stay on the surface or leave the surface. And so we need to know exactly which reactions we want to look at. And so in addition to this surface process simulation module, we have another module that we run first, and this is a thermochemistry analyzer. So what we do in this case is we have, we, we choose the chemical reactions that we think will happen on the surface, and then we run a thermodynamic analysis to compare the Gibbs free energy before the Gibbs free energy of the products compared to the Gibbs free energy of the reactants. And this energy tells us something about the feasibility of that reaction happening. If this reaction is in this way where the energy of the products is lower, then this means that the, the reaction is favorable. But this is not actually enough. What we need, we actually need a little more information in this case, which is that these reactions are not only dependent on the temperature, but they're also dependent on partial pressures of surrounding gases. So let me go through an example. So here is continuing on that example with the hafnium oxide. The question is, the question we posed was, when does hafnium, uh, when does HF etch or deposit on a hafnium oxide or zirconium oxide surface? So here we have we have one path can be just a straight etch where the precursor model module molecule, excuse me, comes down to the surface and etches products away. It can be a direct etch where it comes down and immediately goes back up, or it can deposit first and then, and then, um, or this, in this case, it can deposit, and then here it would, it would um, then leave the surface. So this would be the reaction if we had an etch case, and this would be the reaction if we had a deposition case. 
So now what we can do is we can calculate the energies of each one of these species and then compare what the Gibbs free energy is as a function of temperature. And here I have plotted the four different cases. So red and blue correspond to the, the HF on hafnium oxide and green and orange correspond to the hafnium oxide on zirconium. And then the red and the green would correspond to etching, and the blue and the orange would correspond to the self-limiting reaction. So as I said before, the, the, the lowest Gibbs free energy is essentially the most favorable. So what we can see here is that Below about 500 Kelvin, both the deposition reaction, both deposition reactions, either on zirconium or hafnium, are more favorable than the etch. So if our if the temperature of say our furnace is below 500, then we know that that hafnium is going to to deposit on our oxide surfaces. However, as we increase our temperature, at some point, the, the zirconium will start to be etched here. And this happens at about 550. And then, but in that space, the, the hafnium is still not being etched and the etching of the hafnium won't occur until about 645 Kelvin. And then above, above, 650 or so etching is preferred for both materials. And along with the, the, the GUI for the SPS module, we also have this GUI for the thermal analyzer, where before you run your simulations, you can look at what your um, Gibbs free energy is for different, different um, temperatures. Now, finally, I want to show kind of what we think is the future direction of TCAD. I alluded this before when I was talking about um, the topography simulations. And what this is, is it's essentially the idea is to move simulations, the TCAD simulations, to the equipment in order to, to essentially to shorten the time it takes to get to high volume manufacturing. And these are called essentially manufacturing digital twins. So we're, we're creating a digital version of a piece of equipment, essentially. So here I show on our timeline the, the next direction for TCAD that we think is the next direction, um, which is really to improve, improve the time it takes to reach high volume manufacturing. So on the bottom right, I show a picture of the, the device yield as a function of time. And then I show several different technology nodes. So we see on the left, these larger N14, N22, these larger technology nodes take quicker, don't take as long to reach these high yield rates, right? But if we look at these newer nodes, we really anticipate that they're gonna take a long time to get to to scale up to the point where we can achieve high product yield. So the idea kind of of these, these digital twins is to really optimize these flows so that we can steepen these curves and get to high value manufacturing faster. So here's kind of a schematic of, of what the what the uh, a process controller digital twin could look like. So the basic outline, the important part is, is the process tools reside here. So we see these are our etch tools, our etch machines and our deposition ma machines here. And more and more, they're getting more and more sensors, right? And so already there's, there's thousands of sensors in this machines and 
And this really represents a, a you know, huge data sets, big data. And so we need a way to process this in, you, in real time and then use it to feed back and actually control what's going on in the process. Kind of current, current, um, in, you know, current inspection tools are often are are used to kind of check. Traditionally used to check along the way. So you, you kind of break the vacuum in the process tool and bring it over to your inspection tool and do your metrology and measure things. But what we want to do is we want to increase the amount of in situ metrology so that we have more and more measurements that are done within the machine. And this again will expand this issue with um, having big data to process. So the other point is that, that the idea first is to analyze, be able to go through the process database and control these tools. But big, long term, what we really want to do is be able to control multiple tools across this flow. And so with this in mind, we also have this manufacturing execution system that we kind of put on the top, which, which you can think about in some sense as, as the, as the, the brains of, of the process. So this is kind of keeping control of both on the, on the, the measurement side as well as on the control side. In terms of an actual flow chart, this, this represents kind of our, our concept for the digital twin controllers. So here we have the, the, the kind of the, the computational part, our virtual system. So we take in this data processing part is, is where we take in the, the sensor data from all those thousands of, of sensors that are in the equipment and we process that. Then that's fed into our, our modeling tools, which, which are based on our S-Topo and, and, and our quantum ATK solutions. Then this is passed to our control logic, which is then used to mo make modifications in the equipment based on what the process data tells us. And I should say that the control logic is also kind of a smart algorithm in that it uses control theory to decide how much you're going to adjust the equipment to be able to keep up with what, um, what your targets actually are. So that concludes my, my talk. So I hope these are some of the takeaways that, that you got from this presentation. Traditional process TCAD will continue to play a crucial role in semiconductor manufacturing, but it will be more and more, it will grow and be developed into different types of flow. So it'll go from being traditionally a point point tool where you just use it to say simulate one module or one step in the process to being a flow based tool such as in DTCO and also then becoming a, a tool within that could be used in equipment such as digital twins. So thank you for your attention and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you very much, Sheila, for the very interesting presentation, very interesting uh, capabilities. So um, now the audience, uh, please type your questions in the Q&A part and I will read them and Sheila can answer the questions. Um, Before, so so maybe I can start with a question. Um, so uh, for NMCI, a big part of our users are the graduate students. Mm -hmm. And for these graduate students, when they start their research in the clean room, um, how do you describe um, 
the barrier uh, to get to the point that they can use some of the TCAT, you know, process TCAT um, simulations and being able to, for example, for some process modules, being able to um, cut the time that they need to spend in the clean room and first they do some uh, preliminary design uh, by simulations and then go and make the adjustments in the clean room. How, how would you describe the um, learning barrier to get to that point uh, that they can actually uh, see some benefits in terms of uh, time and effort needed in the clean room? Yeah, I think honestly, as as somebody who who went through that process, so I, I did I got my PhD and I, I even took a class in, in clean in in the clean room. And I think the answer is nearly immediately. I think you really get a benefit even before going into a clean room to under to be able to play around with the process steps and the techniques on the computer first, I think are actually really helpful when you go into the clean room. Because you are you already have some ideas on the mechanisms and the processes and what you expect. And if you kind of go in knowing what to expect, then it's going to direct you better. On top of that, Process TCAT has been around for a really long time. And so it's a, there's, there's a lot of information out there, especially at the level of the the individual process modules, right? Mm -hmm. So, so because the process modules have not changed, you know, radically from transitioning from planar up to you know nano sheet, the under the fundamental understanding of those can be done even before you go into the lab, and they're available and and. Even you, so, for instance, with our with our software, we always provide a lot of um, very fundamental initial examples. We have application notes that that lead you through all of those kind of processes, and um, yeah, I think I think I think even before the lab is the right time to to play around with with TCAD simulations. That's great, and then these. Um... Um, examples that you say are ready and available that can potentially help a lot because then they can just play with it. They don't have to build exactly. everything. Exactly. Yes, exactly, exactly. Great. So uh, one question is, do you also have tools that can model how packaging stress can influence electrical parameters? We do. Um, we do have some work on that. We've been developing those technology, you know, those those things. Um, we've been working on those things more recently, but we do have some of that work. Um, if if anybody, I should say, if if please anybody can send me an email, and and I'm happy to provide, you know actual material and things and and articles and, and things like that if if needed but yes we do have some work going on in packaging especially when it comes to thinking about or specifically when it comes to thinking about heat so so we have a tool um that our our it's centaurus interconnect and we've been using that we have a paper out using that in conjunction with our Centaurus device tool and um, looking at heat propagation from packaging or through packaging. Is so it we can do we can do those kind of things. We don't have a specific tool. We kind of hijack some of the tools we have and and our and and change materials and 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 um and model model kind of indirectly, but yes, we have we have those capabilities too. Right, and 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 when you say heat, is is it heat during operation of the uh, circuit, or is it heat during the uh, processing? So in this case, what I was talking about, with packaging, it would that example would be the heat due to operation. Operation. Yes. 
okay. but yes, you're, that's a very good question because because the heat due to processing is another area that will become more and more important as we go towards 3D integration and and so on. We'll need to start right. thinking about that as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Other questions? So um, if they decide, you know, if someone decides to use the uh, the uh, material and, and 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 examples that are ready for a specific process module, are there easy ways to calibrate the uh, the model with the specific piece of equipment that they have in their clean room? If, if because from what I hear, equipment, you know, piece of equipment to another one, there's, there are variabilities. So there are, are there knobs that they can basically calibrate based on whatever result they're getting and then having yes. more accuracy as they move forward? Yes. The, 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 the short answer is yes. It's, um, I mean, I can't talk too much on this because it's still pr proprietary in terms of our, our work on this, but the the idea is yes, we work very closely with the equipment vendor. To, we would work very closely with the equipment vendors to calibrate the models to their specific equipment. So that's a very calibration is is something I didn't mention too much in this talk, but it's something that's very important across the board. So so these TCAD, you know, even within the process TCAD point tools. There's been a lot of work over the years that people have done to kind of calibrate the models to their own, own, you know, silicon experiments. Mm. So, so calibration is something that's really kind of done a lot of different steps along the way. Okay, great. Um, what is the major limiter in terms of enabling the virtual fab? Is it the in situ monitoring part or the computation slash data analysis? I would say right now it's the it's the it's it's part of it is goes back to what you say is the calibration. That's that's an important part that that needs to be, you know, we need to make sure that what the model is predicting the equipment's providing, right? Um but I would say it's it it's the processing of the big data is the big one I think right now um, in terms of just the number of sensors and the amount of information that is coming from the tools and then how to kind of assign those sensors and that information to the right kind of TCAD model, which is also kind of a form of calibration, right? And and then being able to to you know, figure out how to translate that into the correction. So it's, I don't know if we can really say at this point, there's one more than the other. We're kind of working on all of those parts at the same time, you know, and they're, they're all have their own challenges. So, um, yeah, I, th I think that that will be an easier question to answer once we actually have the product established. Um, if we reverse the, the order of things, so right now all the simulations seem to be bottom up. So you need to define what are the steps that you're using and the processing TCAD uh, will tell you what would be the final product. Is there work on the other direction that if I tell the tool that I want to, I want to build this structure, tell me what process I should use and, you know, what's, what should be the recipe to reach this uh, final structure? Um, yeah. Is, is, is active research being done in this direction or is it too much to ask at this point? Um, yeah, I think, I don't know, actually, to be completely honest. I haven't heard much from, in terms of kind of this bottom down idea. There is, 
there is in kind of indirectly, which is that there's, you know, there's, there's companies out there that will take a product, say a, an iPhone, you know, the newest iPhone, and they'll break it open and, and they'll do all the experiments on it to see what technology was actually used in the device, right? Because these equipment manufacturers don't always tell us, but, you know, they're not completely open with their, you know, their, their products and stuff. And so, you know, we can get information indirectly in that way. And then it becomes a reverse engineering question, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like, okay, this, this company, you know, used, used, looks like they're using this technology, you know, can we reverse engineer it based on, you know, the size and the information that we get from these, these experiments? So that's kind of the area that I can think of where that kind of top down is being done, but it's kind of being done more as a, as a way to, <laughs> to kind of peek into what, what these, these tech companies are actually creating and manufacturing in their electronics. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And um, part of that, I think, also is just that we've been building these these models in S process for so long that the the procedures are pretty well known, right? So, so you know, they're when they try and develop these new technologies, they do tend to be bottom up, just because they're they reside kind of in a in a in a small area of the whole flow. So you kind of know how to do everything else already, but so for instance, the, the uh, like one one challenge right now is figuring out how to put the gate stack in between the nano sheets in these gate all around nano sheet structures, right? So you have how do you put that in there? Well, all you need to do is focus on that kind of module, right? So you wouldn't change the rest of the processing steps. You would just look at you know how you etch and and grow those new materials there without really taking changing the entire flow so i think a lot of the development really is kind of one up things so they do tend to be from the bottom up and not so much from the top down because we just have so much history of simulations mm -hmm, mm -hmm. makes sense makes sense um, so one reason that i ask this is that Within NNCI, we have many researchers and users who are coming from disciplines that are non-semiconductor uh, right. related. So these are from environment, earth, um, um, very different disciplines. And some of them, they don't have much experience with uh, IC fabrication. And, mm -hmm. and, and, the, the, some, and in many cases, what they want to build is very simple. It's not, you know, for, for an expert, it's very simple. But, right. I, you know, a tool that would give them a starting point that, you know, this, if, if you define that you want to get to this, this, right. why do you with that, would be of interest to this broader set of audience, you know, users that, yeah. Our traditional users. Right, so right. What I was thinking about. Uh, yeah, that. yeah. That was kind of my my rationale for wanting to include the quantum ATK kind of level um, analysis in that there's nothing, you know, those, the the surface processing tool, there's nothing specific about semiconductors in that tool. So mm -hmm. essentially you could use it for any thin film growth or even even one could could certainly use it for for looking at catalytic um reactions on surfaces or or um you know it's more than just that that application is more than just um semiconductors okay. well, so I thought that that might be might be interesting and useful to some of yeah. your from some of your um you know students and also I should say we have you know, within our, especially within our quantum ATK, we have university bundles where we we give special, you know, deals to 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 university students to be able to use the use the software. So I would encourage anyone to to look into our quantum ATK um, tools. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
for HVM, uh, you mentioned minimizing impact of tool drifts and process changes. How are, how are those artifacts typically addressed in TCAT? So I guess um, it's referring to tool drifts and process changes. Okay, I, I'm not, can you repeat the question? I'm, I'm sure. not sure if I understand so, the question. I'm sorry. Is that something that um, HVM, uh, was it a process, or was it a simulation tool, HVM? Um, ah, high volume, yeah, HVM is oh, the high, high volume, volume manufacturing. manufacturing. Okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> you mentioned okay, so the, the impact of tool drifts and process changes. How are those artifacts typically addressed in TCAD? So basically the drift in the tool uh, and also is in processes, process changes. So uh, the tool drift. So the idea is that, if I understand the, the, the question properly, the idea is that, um, you know, if you measure the tool drifting, you know, a, a, you know, whatever your drift is. So it, we're talking about etch, I guess. So we measured this, you know, this drift from the etch, and it's really up to the control logic unit to make the the decision on how much to modify the equipment in order to correct for the drift. So it's, we're building, the idea is, is that we kind of build the control logic unit as a smart component so that it doesn't just go, okay, your drift is off by 10%, let's change it by 10% because it may have other things that it needs, you know, other things in the environment that may, you know, be impacting it that it needs to make a decision on. And so we use, um, we essentially use control theory or they, the, the engineers are using control theory to design that part of the, the flow um, to, to properly correct. But that's a good question because that's a very important and very important part of, of, the, of the HVM flow. Because if you have, you know, if you think about it and you, if you have your drift, if you're not really correcting properly for that drift, then there, then your TCAT, then your, your, digital twin is actually doing worse than if you didn't have it, right? If it's telling you to correct in a way that is, is you know, making it worse um, or is, you know, swinging the other way where all of a sudden it, it drifts the other direction. So, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, algorithmics and, and um, work that is going into designing that, that part of the flow as well. Okay, great. Um, I don't see any more questions, but um, this was a lively Q&A part, and Good. thank you very much for the very insightful and, uh, and what I liked about your presentation was that it told us where we started, where we are now, and hopefully where we are heading. Uh, that's that's great. Um, so, uh, David, um, do you have any final announcements or uh, anything else? Thanks, Um I, I just want to thank uh, both you and and Sheila for the seminar today, the webinar. Um, just remind everybody to um, keep an eye on the NNCI website on the our events page, so NNCI.net and the events page, uh, where we'll start posting information about the 2022 webinars. Uh, hopefully pretty soon. Uh, and uh, thanks again for joining us today and uh, have a great rest, a great uh, rest of your week. Thank you very much, Sheila. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you.